Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Doug Bradburn. I'm the founding director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington, which is where you are. You know that because you're here. Delighted to welcome you here tonight to the Washington Leadership Lecture, which we do in partnership with the University of uh, Southern California Saul Price School for Public Policy. Uh, and I just want to start off before we really kick off you know, saying how exciting it is to see such a full room of people here. We are basically one year into this library's existence. It opened in September 27th of last year as part of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association vision for expanding their educational programming and power to teach the world about the life, leadership, and legacy of George Washington, uh, which is also one of the reasons we hold this lecture. Uh, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, if you don't know, you should know their story. And I think in the context of the subject tonight, civic education and citizenship, they actually fit right in. When I speak later, I'll talk a, a little bit about that. Um, but their ability to come together and create the first National Historic Preservation Organization in the 1850s, all managed by women, an extraordinary story in itself in a time when women couldn't own property in their own right, are able to create this national organization to save the tomb and mansion and estate of the father of the country, George Washington, which is falling into disrepair and was about to be divided up by, oh, developers, right? We know that story. Uh, and just the vision they had to save this and preserve this estate for liberty-loving people everywhere uh, is an incredible legacy. They've never taken any government money. Uh, and so they've been one of the great philanthropic institutions in American history. So uh, I'm delighted tonight to be able to welcome some of the ladies of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association here, including our regent, Barbara Lucas, who also represent uh, Maryland. Barbara, you, you ladies, you need to stand when I introduce you, right? Wait, well, hold your applause. Hold your applause, hold your applause. Mary Beth Borthwick from California. Please, Mary Beth, who's also the patron of this great event, which Jack, I'm sure, will talk about shortly as well. Uh, we have Laura Rutherford from Alabama, Susan Townsend, Delaware, Betsy Holdsworth, New Jersey, Ann Scott from Missouri, and Meg Nichols from Maine. So please, give them a round of applause. Being <laughs> in that great leadership, that in that great leadership that was uh, put forward in the 19th century uh, in, in grand fashion, as you see around you. So now, uh, it's my great honor uh, to introduce Jack Knott. Uh, Jack Knott is the dean of the Saul Price School of Public Policy, uh, where he holds the C. Irwin and Ioni L. Piper chair, uh, and he's also a professor. He has his bachelor's degree in history from Calvin College. Now, Jack knows I tease him about this, so he went to Calvin College. And any of you who know anything about uh, Calvinism, uh, you know that there's this obsession with whether you're saved or damned. And in fact, in, in Puritan New England, in the olden times, in the 17th century, there's all these stories of, of people who were so uh, distraught about whether or not they were saved or damned that they would actually commit crimes to prove that they were damned and so they didn't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> and I think that's what happened with Jack Nott because he was a history major at Calvin College, but then he goes on and gets a master's degree in economics and comparative politics from Johns Hopkins University, a School of Advanced International Studies, and a PhD in political science from Berkeley. So you know he was doing that just to make sure he knew he was going to be damned. He abandoned <laughs> history and went into the grubby, dismal sciences uh, where he remains today. But uh, in his defense, he's, he's, you know, he's doing it uh, with great um, effect. He is one of the most eminent figures uh, in his field, leading scholar in the fields of political institutions and public policy, health policy, public management. He was elected to the National Academy of Public Administration, one of the two congressionally chartered national academies. He's the author of many, many articles in prestigious journals, all of which are of great importance and interest, and three books, uh, including Reforming Bureaucracy, the Politics of Institutional Choice, uh, please, everyone, welcome Jack Knott. Uh, thank you very much, Doug. Uh, it turns out uh, 
my parents and several people in Grand Rapids where I grew up after I graduated from college and I decided to go to Berkeley did kind of think I'd gone over to the dark side. So uh, <laughs> there is a little bit of truth in that. <laughs> um, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I really want to welcome you on behalf of the USC Sol Price School of Public Policy uh, to this evening's lecture. Uh, last year, the USC Price School and the Fred W. Smith National Library partnered to launch the George Washington Leadership Lecture Series. Uh, these events explore President Washington's lifelong accomplishments, including a better understanding of him as a person, uh, his remarkable leadership capabilities, as well as his professional achievements and his unbelievable legacy. And they also focus on the implications of George Washington's legacy for leadership and public policy today, in today's world. Now, uh, as was mentioned, uh, this collaboration is made possible by the generous support of Mary Beth and Hal uh, Borthwick. Uh, Mary Beth is a distinguished USC alumna and serves as the Vice Regent for California of, Mount, of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. So she has a foot in both places and brought the two institutions together in this remarkable way. So we're very excited to extend the series into its second year, carrying on the momentum from the first year. Uh, we hold one lecture on each coast. Uh, so on January 21st, we'll host the Los Angeles lecture at the USC campus. And uh, I invite you all uh, to attend that lecture as well. Uh, it may give you an excuse uh, to, uh, or a good reason to uh, take a break from the cold weather here in uh, Washington and come out to Southern California. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, a special guest here, uh, to the Price School at least, who is here tonight, and that's Courtney Griswell, who is a member of our Leadership Council of the Price a uh, support group called the Athenian Society. Is uh, uh, Courtney here? Yeah, Courtney, there you are. Uh, welcome. We're very pleased that you can be here as well. Uh, some of you may not know that much about the USC Price School of Public Policy and the work that we do. I just wanted to take briefly a couple moments to explain that. Uh, our mission is to improve the quality of life for people and their communities. So we are established over 80 years ago in 1928-29, so we're one of the oldest public affairs schools in the country. Uh, and today we rank uh, number six uh, in the nation by the at least U.S. News and World Report, so we're a very prominent school uh, as well as one of the largest and oldest schools in the country. Uh, we're truly an interdisciplinary school uh, with academic programs in the field of public administration, nonprofit leadership, health policy and management, uh, public policy, as well as urban planning and real estate development. Now, we weave these related disciplines together, and we reach across the public, private, nonprofit sectors, uh, and we're uniquely positioned then to address some of the most pressing policy and governance issues facing the country, as well as looking for new opportunities for building better communities uh, for the future. Uh, in many ways, uh, I was astounded to learn that uh, George Washington and his work aligns very closely with that of the Price School. Uh, he contributed to shaping the fields in which our faculty do scholarship, as well as our students pursue careers. Uh, he was, of course, uh, a government leader serving as president and as a great military leader, so obviously a hugely important public policy person, uh, but he was also a surveyor. He was a city planner of Washington, D.C., and a real estate uh, developer in Ohio, and an innovator in disease prevention, wound care, and nutrition at Valley Forge. So in a very unique way, George Washington touches every single aspect of our school. So that's what one of the reasons that makes me very excited about this partnership. So together with the Fred W. Smith National Library, we look forward to advancing the study of George Washington and promoting the values that he embraced, including citizenship and civic leadership, uh, which is the focus of tonight's talk. Uh, Washington himself said that one of our primary objectives as a country should be, and I'm quoting here, the education of our youth in the science of government, unquote. He asked, 
quote, in a republic, what species of knowledge can be equally important as the science of government? That's why I went into political science. Uh, and what duty more pressing than communicating it to those who are to be the future guardian, guardians of the liberty of our country? This evening, we have the privilege of learning more about this topic of civ civic education and uh, the learning of what it is to be and live in a democracy from the expertise of doc, Dr. Doug uh, Braeburn, uh, as well as U.S. Undersecretary of Education, Ted Mitchell, uh, and we look forward to a really great discussion. But at this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator of our discussion, uh, USC Price Professor, Dr. David Sloan. Uh, David is a leading expert and scholar in American urban history urban policy and planning, and community health planning. His most recent book is entitled Planning Los Angeles, and he is the principal investigator on a major grant from the Center for Disease Control to study strategies for overcoming health disparities in diverse, low-income urban neighborhoods. He is also the former director of our urban planning graduate programs, and most recently directed our interdisciplinary undergraduate program, which is our largest uh, program in the school. Uh, and under his leadership, he introduced significant new uh, curriculum uh, reforms into our undergraduate program, uh, preparing our students better for graduate study or a professional career. Uh, in addition, and, and for tonight, most importantly, David is the Price School's primary liaison to the George Washington Library at Mount Vernon. And given his expertise and background uh, and how that relates to George Washington's values and work, uh, he's the perfect person for this role. So please join me in welcoming Dr. David Sloan. Thank you very much. Um, it, isn't this a beautiful room? I just, uh, every time I walk up to it, it's now my third or uh, third time, I think, being here, and I just marvel at how gorgeous it is. I am pleased to add my welcome to Dean Knotts and Director Brad Burns. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're here. This is fun, isn't it? Once again, I would like to congratulate the ladies for their foresight to develop and build this marvelous library. Um, sorry, I'm, there's like two mics, and I'm worried that they're going to create, yeah. Sorry, my, my technical expertise is not very big, so that's why uh, I'm doing my talks from a phone, just to show how technologically advanced I am. <laughs> I would like to congratulate the ladies for their foresight to develop and build this marvelous library, a symbol not just of Washington's continuing relevance to our world, but also to Mount Vernon's commitment to education and research. Tonight, we are in for what I think as a, of as a real treat. Two deeply knowledgeable historians and scholars are going to take us on a fast trip through American history, focusing on an issue critical to the founding generation and to us. What is citizenship? How do we understand that concept? How do we teach it? How do we educate ourselves and those who will follow us to be good citizens? and believe in our democracy? Not surprisingly, these questions are not simply answered, and the debates about them span the centuries of our nation, as well as are very relevant to our current debates in Washington and around the country. From the efforts of President Washington to create a national university, to our current debates about the appropriateness of educating children who entered our society without documents, now called the dreamers, after the legislation that would ease their way. The rights of citizenship and the meaning of citizenship have stoked debate and discussion. And I hope we will continue that discussion this evening. Our speaker really needs no introduction to you. One, he's already been up here. And then more importantly, you all know him very well. Doug Bradburn is uh, the person who I immediately thought of when I thought about this as one of the ideas for uh, this, this series. 
I, w uh, sorry, I immediately suggest that Director Doug Bradburn bring to our discussions his extensive knowledge about the revolutionary era, particularly the arguments he developed in his lovely book, and I would encourage you to read it, um, The Citizenship Revolution, Politics, and the Creation of the American Union from 1774 to 1804. Ted Mitchell will follow Doug's analysis of the revolutionary era by taking us on a quick tour of early American education, reconstruction, and progressive era controversies, and finish up with a brief consideration of our contemporary education debates. After the two speakers, we will have a little panel session. Chairs are already set up. Leading into a yummy reception, we will be asking for questions from the audience during that panel discussion, so keep your questions in mind as you listen to our two speakers and as we begin that panel. I am distinctly pleased to introduce you to Doug Bradburn, the founding director of the Fred W. Smith Library for the Study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. Prior to assuming that position and doing such a fabulous job at it, he had carved out an exemplary career as an historian, at the, mostly at Binghamton University, during which he published extensively on issues related to the colonial revolution era and the early national, the colonial, the revolutionary, and early national periods. Please join me in warmly welcoming Doug Bradburn. Thank you, David. I appreciate the invitation to be a part of this uh, in incredible lecture series. It's really been a delight uh, to see it come uh, together. Last year, it was the first event we had in the library. Uh, we had Dr. Kenneth Starr talking about Washington in the West, which is a, a great occasion. And, uh, and we're going to keep it going tonight. Now, the trick is not going on and on about a subject that uh, uh, I like to tell people about. Um, so let's go ahead and and begin. All right. Well, that's the wrong George there, isn't it? Uh, you know, so what is citizenship in America? It's been a vexing problem since we've got rid of this guy in all the fur robes right here. Uh, George III replaced by this other George. You'll notice the, the uh, Peel portrait of Washington was a reference to the uh, portrait, the, uh, the uh, coronation portrait of the king known to all colonial Americans who were subjects of a king. Uh, and with the revolution, they didn't create another king. They created a whole different system of thinking about the way society should function. They created citizens of a nation. Both of those concepts were fraught with challenges in a country which had, uh, had never had such a thing. Citizens, when George Washington was a boy, meant that you lived in a city. If you look at an English dictionary 10 years before the American Revolution and you look up what citizen meant, it meant someone who lived in a city. And it would come on to take on much more important uh, signification over the course of his life. Citizens become uh, something powerful. These are people who rule themselves. Uh, and this is something that was recognized very early on as an important transition of the American Revolution itself, the fundamental principles of what the American Revolution uh, is about. So the first historian of the Revolution, for instance, David Ramsey, here's a nice a portrait of him by Rembrandt Peel. Ramsey noted, quote, the principle of government had been radically changed by the Revolution, and the political character of the people was also changed from subjects to citizens. And the difference is immense, is what he said. Subjects look up to a master. But citizens are so far equal that none have hereditary rights superior to others. Each citizen of a free state contains within himself, by nature and the Constitution, as much of the common sovereignty as another. In the eye of reason and philosophy, the political condition of citizens is more exalted than that of noblemen. Dukes and earls are the creatures of kings and may be made by them at their pleasure, but citizens possess in their own right original sovereignty. Citizens were something powerful in the revolutionary age. It was a transformational status for people. And for true revolutionaries, they were thought to be the polar opposite of subjects. Subjects, subjecthood itself derived from a feudal status of perpetual allegiance and inferiority, submission, with a guiding logic based on power and necessity, 
whereas citizenship was considered at the time a modern status of freedom and equality. With citizens and citizenship as the effect of compact, of choice. People choose to be a citizen of a country. They can leave a country. If you're a subject of a king, you can never leave that allegiance. So this, this status of citizen is, is a transformational one. Uh, and it goes on, of course, to affect the character of early American democracy, the expansion of voting rights, the destruction of religious establishments, no more church and state. This is fundamentally transformational in the world. Uh, as well as the creation of written constitutions to protect the individual rights of citizens. This is the, the, the fundamental principles of America's founding. All men are created equal, citizens are equal, governments exist to protect their rights. If they don't, they can be overthrown. This is an amazing uh, doctrine. Now, in its uh, idealistic form, as I've been talking about it, you know, we, we see George Washington and many others writing and speaking in this way. Famously for Washington is his letter to the Turo congregation uh, in Newport, for instance. Let me read a little bit of that letter if you don't know it. Washington has become president now. Uh, he's being uh, congratulated by the, the Jews of Newport. Uh, and he writes back to them, quote, the citizens of the United States have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more than toleration is spoken of, as if it was the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. And he goes on, for happily the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens, and giving it on all occasions their effectual support. So here's a meaning of citizenship that Washington's expressing, which is that citizens enjoy their natural rights. They're not given privileges. They're not tolerated. They have these natural rights that are protected for them. And that's what equality is about. Uh, and this is a very important uh, letter and message in the history of America's uh, struggle with understanding those boundaries of equality, because it is a struggle. Because I've been talking about the idealistic formulations of citizenship and the, and the problem of equality. Because, and here you get here, there's lots of habits that are hard to break from subject to, right? And this is a great image because it's, it's uh, it's Thomas Jefferson. He's writing a draft of the Declaration of Independence, and he, he first writes, our fellow subjects. You see it there on the bottom line, right? That's an old habit he's trying to break. And, and what does he do? He's got ink. You know, he has a feather, an inkwell. So he just writes carefully citizens, right, over subjects, you know. And nobody knew about this until our modern technology is able to discover that this is beneath there. But it's a great symbol and metaphor, really, for the problem of citizenship, because you have all of these habits that are hard to break from colonial subjecthood, all of these bigotries and prejudices that persist from the colonial era, hierarchies that give the lie to you know, equality itself. I mean, women, of course, are not given the right to vote. They're not political citizens in the founding era. That's a remnant, of course, of, of the laws of subjecthood, uh, different uh, uh, classes of people, there's constraints on property rights and, and how they have political rights. Uh, we have racial limitations on equal citizenship with for their long history. And that's one of the things that needs to be emphasized tonight in our conversation, is that citizenship and the problems of citizenship are always aspirational to live up to these ideals of the founding. The notion of equal citizens who rule themselves is an ongoing challenge, ultimately. Challenge, ultimately. Well, there's another problem in the founding era, and that is just exactly what you're a citizen of. Uh, I mean, are you a citizen of a state? Are you a Pennsylvanian or a Delawarean or from South Carolina? Are you a citizen of a nation? The seal of the United States on the right there makes it all pretty clear, right? Uh, e pluribus unum. Well, clear if you know Latin, I guess. So from many one, right? Okay, so from many one. That's a great aspirational characteristic of what it means to be an American. That it's a bunch of different peoples who come together to make this new nation and, and, and are part of this new uh, community. But people at the time even would disagree about what exactly they were. So John Jay, you see this gentleman at the top, the first Supreme Court Justice, writes, 
Providence has been pleased to give this one connected country to one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, very similar in their manners and customs. You know, this is a vision of a nation in which everybody's descended from the same people. Uh, and it's propaganda that Jay is saying at the time because you know, he, he, his own family is descended from French Huguenots. Um, but he's writing this in the Federalist Papers number two. This is a document that's trying to convince people to think about their national ties as they're approving this new constitution, which is going to be a new national government. At the same time, Edward Thornton, who's a Brit, uh, he's part of the uh, diplomatic class, and he's, he's, he's in New York City, and he's looking around him, and here's what he says. What will be the language or what the national character of a people composed of such heterogeneous particles collected and huddled together from all parts of the world? It is impossible to say. Right, so you could have it in many ways uh, in the early republic. What was America was still very much open for debate, uh, for conversation, and that again is the other problem of citizenship, another one that you know, we continue uh, to wonder about today. What is the fundamental national character of Americans? How do we maintain it? How do we, uh, how do we succeed uh, and extend our principles in the midst of diversity, right? So, all right, so one of the things that happens in the founding era that's caused by these dilemmas opened up by citizenship. So on the one hand, you have this, this status where everybody who's a citizen is this powerful, more powerful than a duke, is this powerful person who's ruling themselves. And on the other hand, you have these, this challenge is the growth and really revolution in civic education. A belief that the country needs to educate the citizenry because the citizenry has to rule itself and a great concern that citizens will be ignorant and therefore not only govern themselves poorly, but lose the advantages of independence and freedom that's essentially their inheritance. And so right away, immediately, you see uh, this tremendous uh, body of civic education, really transformation. So here you have Noah Webster. You'll all recognize Noah Webster, Webster's Dictionary, Webster's American Dictionary. Webster's trying to create an American dictionary for Americans to define what this new nation is going to be in the midst of ambiguity. And, and so here you see an American selection, and the emphasis is on American. This is for Americans, an American selection of lessons in reading and speaking, calculating to improve the minds and refine the taste of youth. Webster's complaining about the chapbooks and school books that everybody's reading, and he writes in, in terms that might sound familiar. Quote, I consider it a capital fault in all our schools that the books generally used contain subjects wholly uninteresting to all our youth. <laughs> While the writings that marked the revolution, which are perhaps not inferior to the orations of Cicero or Demosthenes, and which are calculated to impress inter interesting truths upon young minds lie neglected and forgotten. Several of those masterly addresses of Congress written at the commencement of the late revolution contain such noble sentiments of liberty and patriotism that I cannot help wishing to transfuse them into the breast of the rising generation. Look at that metaphor, transfuse them into the breast of the rising generation. Uh, you know, he, he quotes on this page, you'll see the Comte de Merveu, uh, it's a fantastic quote here. Begin with the infant in his cradle, let the first word he lists be Washington. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do here in this building, right? <laughs> we're trying to get the Common Core to recognize these important documents that should be part of the reading lessons of all these young youth. Because what, what the founders believed in fundamentally and what was required by a society that's going to be governed by these new things called citizens was that there was a civic duty uh, uh, to teach citizens the morality and the principles of the founding. It's essential for the education of citizens who are needed to ultimately defend this country uh, and govern themselves, ultimately. So education wasn't about learning things so you could do particular things. It, that, it was part of that as well. I mean, this is a book on grammar. But it's also a moral imperative to, to improve citizens so that the country can achieve those aspirational goals that are part of its uh, very moment. And I think that's an important uh, part of civic education that is too often lost, that uh, true patriotism needs to be taught uh, to a citizenry that has to govern itself in a democratic society. So we well, see this revolution in, in civic education. And the 50 years after the founding, 
you look at all the colleges and universities that are founded and add to that you know, the, the private schools, the boarding schools, the, the other preparatory schools, as well as the public schools that some states start instituting immediately, and you, you get an extraordinary effusion of institutions of higher learning, all devoted to training citizens to govern themselves. And this includes education for women, because women were understood to be the primary trainers of morality of future citizens. Women happen to give birth to citizens all the time. And so they had this role to play, uh, and it's a notion known as Republican motherhood, and it fits entirely into what the Mount Vernon Ladies Association was doing in the 19th century, defending the story of patriotism and true morality in the United States by protecting the house of the father of the country. This is perfectly uh, associated with what women were, they were the protectors and guarantors of American uh, citizenship and, and morality. Uh, in a fundamental way. So some of those institutions created uh, the Litchfield School, ultimately the Troy Female Seminary. The leaders of the women's rights movements are all educated in these schools that are created in the midst of the revolution itself. Uh, so that's an important and crucial moment. Okay, so for the rest of my talk, though, the Saul Price people are, are getting anxious because uh, the Saul Price School, as you notice, is a school of public policy. So let's talk about policy. We gotta get to the, get to the facts here, and so, the next uh, seven minutes or so, we'll, we'll, we'll do a quick run through of one of the most important policies affected by this question about citizenship, and that is, how do you become a citizen in the United States? Well, you become a citizen by being born, and you also become a citizen by being naturalized. Right? And think of that whole, that whole word, you're becoming a natural born citizen, essentially. You're an alien, and then through the magical process of law, you now become one of these, these citizens. And it's an extraordinary story of policy in the first decade after the Constitution. Now, uh, Americans were incredibly enthusiastic for immigration in the revolutionary period. In fact, if you read your Declaration of Independence in the middle part there, where it talks about all the reasons the king was such a jerk, right? It, it, that one of those things it lists is that the king stopped uh, the ability of the colonies uh, to encourage migration and naturalization. The Constitution creates the first opportunity to create a, natural, a, a national law of, of naturalization. And so what you see is, is extraordinary. Uh, there are four general bills of naturalization passed by the U.S. Congress between 1790 and 1802. And then there's not another general bill of naturalization passed until 1906. All right? So you have four bills on this fundamental topic of how immigrants become citizens within the first decade and two years of the Constitution, and then not another when you have 50 million immigrants coming to the United States in the 19th century, not another general bill until the beginning of the 20th century. So the question then is why? What is going on? Why so many? What does it mean? Uh, well, what it means is, uh, what we ver see very quickly, is that Americans not only uh, uh, encourage uh, education of citizenry, but they fight politically over the character of American citizenship. That's fundamental. Once politics begins, the fight over that begins. So uh, the first law of naturalization allows any immigrant to come to the country and after residing for one year in America, they can go to a court, any recognized court, declare their intention to become a citizen, they can become a citizen. So it's a, a residency requirement of one year for all immigrants to become citizens. Uh, as we'll see, that gets changed uh, very rapidly. And, and so why does it get changed? Well, ah, the French Revolution. Uh, it's hard for modern audiences to understand how important the French are in the 18th century. They're a superpower. It, you know, they are the most important center of, and they have this, their country blows up, and then the revolution looks like, well, maybe this will be a constitutional monarchy, monarchy that, emerges, that emerges, and maybe, and maybe this will turn out okay, and that's when, and that's when the Marquis de Lafayette, Lafayette sends, sends the key to the, key to the Bastille, Bastille to Washington, to Washington monarchy that emerges, and maybe this will turn out okay, and that's when the Marquis de Lafayette sends the key to the Bastille to Washington, which is, you know, nailed to the wall at the Mount Vernon mansion. Well, nailed, screwed to the wall in the Mount Vernon mansion. <laughs> Uh, and, and, but then, of course, the French Revolution turns bloody, and you, you, uh, Monsieur Le Guillotine right, has visited upon the nobility of the land. And so what do great revolutions do? They create refugees. And so you get massive amounts of people spilling out of Europe. Uh, radical immigrants from the British Isles, Ireland, Scotland, 
England itself, people who want to revolutionize England are kicked out of England, and guess where they come? They come to the United States. Uh, and then, of course, there's nobility in France who are fleeing from, uh, from uh, France, and where do they end up? They end up all over the place, but they end up in the United States. And then, you, of course, you have planters from Saint-Domingue, where you have slave uh, revolts and ultimately the Haitian Revolution. All these people are ending up in North America. And so uh, the question of whether or not they can become citizens becomes crucially important. Uh, and in fact, both parties that emerge argue that we need to increase the residency time. So. Uh, the two parties that are starting to emerge, in part in sympathy to the course of the French Revolution. Uh, Washington and his administration, particularly led by Alexander Hamilton, become the Federalists. Uh, they are not enthusiasts for what's happening in France. They want to keep the country out of war. But there's a whole faction of people who are very enthusiastic about the French Revolution who become Jeffersonian Republicans, and they want to see more action on, on different items. Uh, and so. You, you, both of these groups want to extend the residency time, so it's increased to five years in 1795. And you get a good sense of how this plays out in American partisan politics, because very quickly the opposition party is starting to be pinned as non-American or un-American in crucial ways. You look at this fantastic uh, cartoon, uh, political cartoon, what you see is a bunch of uh, stereotypes. You see a bunch of ethnic groups and others. So, for instance, you have this... Uh, this uh, fat guy in the middle, I, I sympathize with him. He, he's a German, you can tell, because he's drinking lager beer. And, and he's actually two fisting He's got one here, and he's got one there. Uh, you, you have another person you can't read who's an Irishman. You've got a, a Frenchman who's singing the French Revolutionary song. Uh, you have a Jew here counting money, right? Uh, right there. You have basically a pirate, which means somebody who's willing to do anything. You have an African American, it's Benjamin Banneker. Uh, and then, of course, you have these crazy academics over here, all like loony and you know, into science and stuff like that. <laughs> it's all very un-American stuff, right? I mean, these people are all not true Americans. And, of course, the devil makes an appearance uh, on the end there. Uh, so this is crucial. But, but this is both sides are really doing this. They're both saying that they represent the true American nation better than the other. And that's what politics becomes in the 1790s. Is, who is speaking for what is truly American, and it gets bound up into the citizenship legislation of naturalization. Now, Washington, of course, who we, we love, uh, steps in and, and he tries to calm the waters. He wants to stand above party, and in his defense, he was elected unanimously, uh, and so he, he's effective in doing that uh, in that way. And he writes in his farewell address to the Union, he's trying to convince the parties to calm down a little bit and to see themselves as all one part of one nation. As he writes, citizens, by birth or choice of a common country, that country has a right to concentrate your affections. The name of American, which belongs to you in your national capacity, must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any appellation derived from local distinctions. With slight shades of difference, you have the same religion, manners, habits, and political principles. You have in a common cause fought and triumphed together. The independence and liberty you possess are the work of joint councils and joint efforts of common dangers, sufferings, and successes. And he hoped that his farewell address could, quote, moderate the fury of public party spirit, warn against the mischiefs of foreign intrigue, and guard against the impostures of pretended patriotism. Now, do well, Washington resigns from office, comes back to beautiful Mount Vernon, decides he only has one house left to build, this library that he immediately starts building. Uh, and then, uh, but what do the American people do? Do they listen to Washington? Do they calm down a little bit? Uh, well, uh, no, they don't. Uh, in fact, the parties get even more extreme. And in fact, in Congress, this is a representation of a battle in Congress, in the not so hollowed halls of Congress between. A, a Federalist congressman from Connecticut who's attacking this guy uh, with his cane and he grabs up the fire tongs and they go at each other uh, in Congress. So this speaks to this increasingly riven politics uh, that gets worse and worse. John Adams, as president, uh, has to try to solve the great problem of the French. The French Revolutionary Wars are spinning out of control. The French are attacking American shipping. Adams sends his ministers over there to meet with the French. What happens? The French say, no, uh, we will not meet with you without payment first. You know, you pay to play situation, which is pretty common in Europe when you're the, the big guy on the block. And the Americans, of course, are insulted by this, and they say, you know, Millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute, right? 
And the French also threaten if the Americans don't pay that they will overturn the American government. And, and this is a real threat because the French are actually doing this in Switzerland at the time. They're doing it to the ancient Republic of Genoa, which had a written constitution going back to, no, ancient Republic of Venice, actually. A written constitution going back to 373 or something like that. The French overthrow that republic. And so threatening the young United States is a, it's a real threat. And so what happens? So the Americans go back, they're, they're infuriated, and it becomes this nationalist, patriotic spring of 1798. You get your first national anthem, Hail Columbia. You get the first national army that's created in the midst of this. The Marine Corps is created. You get the creation of a new navy. But uh, the Federalists, in their moment of triumph, go a little bit too far, right? Because this is the moment that they pass the Alien and Sedition Acts, uh, and, and, um, uh, and they also uh, pass uh, the Naturalization Act of 1798, which is, extends the residency from five years to 14 years, right? So 14 years before an immigrant can become uh, a, a citizen. So as I conclude here, there's the Sedition Act, what you see then is an, a tremendous opposition to all of this, a fight over the fundamental meaning of citizenship. You have a rebellion, you have all these petitions against the Alien Sedition Acts, you have these extensive notions of what the rights of free speech are, you have advocates for ethnic rights and immigrant rights, which leads to the only resistance in America that matters, the election of Thomas Jefferson, the overthrow of the Federalists in power. And Jefferson rightly grapples and grabs onto the legacy of George Washington. As the, uh, as the man who can stand above party. And she says in his inauguration, we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans. Now Washington has fortunately died at this point, and so Jefferson actually gets this print of the apotheosis of Washington and hangs it in the White House. And you get a new naturalization law, which reverts back to the residency requirement of five years. And so I think the lessons for all of us as we move on to the, the next speaker is this continuing contestation over citizenship the meaning of rights, and the role in which immigrants can be properly brought into a, a very powerful status, a status of a citizen uh, of America. So I'm going to hand it over. Thank you. Thank you. I am very pleased to introduce my friend and longtime colleague, Ted Theodore Mitchell. He is currently under secretary in the United States Department of Education. But for me, he always will remain my, one of my first historian friends. We, uh, we worked together at Dartmouth College a couple of years ago. Since then, he's uh, been the dean of education at the University of California at Los Angeles. He was the president of Occidental College. And he was the president of the New Schools Venture fund that worked to create charter schools and change uh, education in the United States for the better. He is a remarkable man, uh, just an extraordinary historian and scholar and uh, public servant. Please welcome my friend, Ted Mitchell. Thank you, David. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's an honor to be here it's, uh, uh, to be at Mount Vernon to be talking about this topic, to be here uh, uh, sharing the, the platform with, with Doug. That was extraordinary, Doug, uh, uh, giving us a great, great start. Um, let me pick up where Doug left off. The French Revolution, rebellions at home, waves of immigrants coming into the country, Alien and Sedition Act, changes in citizenship laws, absolutely, and changes in the way even some of those elderly founders are beginning to think about the task of education. So let me go back and then forward. So Doug laid out the, what I think we all believe to be the true hallmarks of Republican virtue. Honesty, integrity, the ability to, to work together to build a community, independence of mind, uh, freedom of thought, freedom of behavior within some constraints, right? So it's the constraint part that starts to come into the language about education around the turn of the century. And so you have the beginning of two relatively oppositional polls that I want to talk about for a little bit. One, a view of citizenship that's fundamentally grounded in liberty 
and the values of freedom, and the other in the importance of order to create and maintain social cohesion. So liberty and order, I'm going to argue with to you tonight, become sort of the twin organizing principles around citizen education in the United States, and they're at some odds at different points. So let's take that romp that David promised through, uh, through American history. So you got 10 years, 20 years, right? And I get um, 200? OK. <laughs> we got to go. We got we to gotta, we gotta move. We got to move. We got to move. Um, so at the end of the Republican period, uh, Benjamin uh, in Philadelphia, who has been on both sides of this debate, uh, uh, is beginning to worry about all of the social uh, disorder. And uh, he, he writes a letter in which he, after talking a little bit about the disorder, talking about the need for a national education system, says, I believe that it is possible to create a school system in which children are educated to be Republican machines. Be Republican machines. Let's remember that. Uh, Doug introduced us to Webster. I wish I had uh, my fancy slides up here. Home court advantages, really. Um, you know, Web Webster not only uh, uh, created essentially a catechism uh, for the new republic, but also created an industry, uh, the first sort of national publishing industry that centralized uh, what kids, no matter what kind of school they were in, were reading. That act in itself was the beginning of one uh, mechanism by which uh, we create uh, sort of a national identity and a national curriculum. That one happens to be born by a marketplace. But the other thing the revolutionary generation did in their language and their rhetoric was to establish the idea that the nation itself had an independent interest in the education of its citizens to create and sustain citizenship and, and order uh, in, in the community. So one of the things that comes out of the revolutionary period is this notion that with a public interest, public resources could and should be spent to create schools that perpetuated the republic. And it's not too long an extension to argue that really the notion of public schooling in America has its origins around this idea that the founders established that we needed to create schools to build citizens. So let's jump forward uh, a little bit. Um, let's go to the end of the Civil War and the beginning of Reconstruction. I've leaving aside a few social movements, a couple presidents, uh, but we'll, 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 we'll come back to it, I think. Um, the Civil War has often been recognized as uh, a place in our time where the role of the state was expanded greatly. Uh, the needs of the North to create a war economy and to manage production between the government and in industry created a new identity for the federal treasury and it created an extraordinary challenge for the national challenge for the national government in relation to schools. The 1830s saw the beginning of common schools. They were mostly local. There were a few states that had uh, compulsory education laws. But what happens at the end of the Civil War? All of a sudden, there are overnight millions of new citizens, millions of freed slaves who had no tradition of living and working in a democratic society, of developing independent authority over their work and their relation with others. And they were, without the residency requirements, citizens of the United States. What to do? The Army became the first national school system in the United States uh, with the creation uh, of a, an arm of the Army under a Vermonter named John Eaton that was charged with the education of all of the freed slaves in the two southernmost regions of the Army's occupation in the South. Uh, what Eaton did is he recruited uh, missionaries from the North who were much more than willing to come and help educate uh, and evangelize with the freed slaves. And they built a curriculum for the freed slaves that is the next punctuation mark in this journey through uh, education and citizenship. The Freedman's Book, drawing in many ways from the same structure of Webster's books, combined grammatical lessons with stories of national heroes, starting with Washington, who embodied the virtues of the republic, the integrity, 
the discipline, uh, the interpersonal honesty, uh, the, the uh, forthright uh, relations with each other. This kind of education was important for both the North and for the freed slaves. For the freed slaves, they had associated freedom and education in visceral ways throughout their enslavement. Time and time again in reading through the diaries of the freedmen that were collected uh, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, you hear the same refrain, education was my route to freedom, freedom was my route to education. As one former slave said it, there is one sin that slavery committed against me which I will never forgive. It robbed me of my education. And so for slaves, ex-slaves, the thirst for the kind of education that embodied freedom for them was palpable. For northern missionaries, that same sense of liberating slaves from their intellectual bonds, their emotional bonds, their religious captivity was extraordinary. For the army and for the government, all of that was true. And it was vitally important that the energies, that the political and cultural and social and economic energies of the slaves be ordered and channeled in ways that didn't disrupt the society in ways that folks experienced at the turn of the 19th century. So the core curriculum of the Freedmen's Bureau schools and the Freedmen's book, books tried to combine this idea of liberty and order and began to lean more toward the ordering side. There was a lot of moral instruction. Here's a part from a speller. Uh, the web is a net. If a fly gets in it, he cannot get out. Sin is a web. Only the bad boy is in it. But no one can, but God can aim him, so aid him. Uh, in its preface, the Freedman's Speller aimed, quote, to show words in connection with important practical subjects, especially occupations, domestic life, civil institutions, morals, and the natural sciences. The choice of these was significant. They were both about character building, uh, and they were about uh, guiding and channeling African-American efforts uh, uh, into what was a new and open uh, economy. Texts over and over again focused on this issue of labor, what to do about labor. Friedman's Spelling Book says, defines labor as a universal duty and beneficial to all. To read through these lessons about labor you might think that they were aimed at a people who had never labored, rather than at a people whose entire existence had been defined by toil. Yet the relentless emphasis on the virtues of labor and the explicit descriptions of the kinds of labor that were appropriate for freedmen bespeak both a particular concern among whites for channeling black labor and the more enduring and general Calvinist themes that linked that labor with salvation. The Freedman's third reader introduced these themes in a remarkable poem simply entitled, Labor. Labor, labor, honest labor. Creative, isn't it? Uh, labor keeps me well and strong. Labor gives me food and raiment. Labor, too, inspires my song. What was clear was, that, was the fact that the Freedman's book and it's all of its various permutations didn't aim at equal citizenship, nor equal participation in civic life, but instead to prepare former slaves for the roles that they would play in a society highly structured by class, history, and importantly, race and ethnicity. The citizenship of the Freedmen's Bureau was a structured, ordered citizenship that in the end bore only passing resemblance to the civic education that focused on liberty that dominated the early revolutionary period. It was an important turn in the history of the idea of citizenship in the mechanics of civic education and in the relationship between the state and public schooling. Final stop on our tour is the progressive era, which for our purposes uh, we'll talk about from roughly 1890 to 1914 to the opening of World War I. It was another period of great immigration, flooding American cities with 8 million souls in just 10 years during the 1890s. 
For social reformers who were concerned about the conditions in which those immigrants lived, the scenes of urban squalor, unregulated child labor, and growing income disparities, centralization of corporate and political power, described nothing short of a crisis in civil life. Others saw in that same data a period of unrest and rising dissent, labor organizing, the growing radicalism of the working class fueled by the new immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe, fractured well-established power relationships in, in urban communities. What's interesting, whether you're a social reformer or someone who's worried about the disintegration of traditional power relationships, is both, both turn to education as the way to solve the problem, square the circle, and create a, a community that John Dewey would, would describe as worthy, harmonious, and whole. Doug talked about uh, citizenship as always being aspirational. That was Dewey's aspiration, was a, a, a social community, a, a nation that was worthy of the ideals of democracy, that was harmonious between different peoples, and that in the end was e pluribus unum, was whole. The roots that reformers took and those who were more concerned with uh, bringing order out of disorder were very different. And what makes the progressive era so fascinating is that both sides did try to do their work in education. On the one hand, I think many of you know that the progressive philosophies of John Dewey for curriculum and school structure were open. Uh, Montessori schools would be the closest uh, thing, descendant that we have to what Dewey envisioned education to be like. Uh, and there were instances, including famously the Chicago University of Chicago Lab School, that played out Dewey's idea of curriculum, focusing on, on individual child liberty to create values and ideals consistent. On the other side, there were administrative reformers who worked to make schools, back to uh, uh, Russia's notion of uh, um, Republican machines, uh, to make schools into the places to make schools into the places where community was forged by putting people together in a very well ordered system. Elwood P. Coverley uh, was the uh, dean of the Stanford School of Education and the primary exponent. I used to wander around Coverley Library all the time uh, of this particular way of thinking uh, thinking about things. Uh, and I'm quoting for Coverley: Our schools are factories in which the raw materials are to be shaped and fashioned into products to meet the various needs of life. It's the business of the school to build its pupils to the specifications laid down. In the end, the specifications laid down were both economic and civic. They placed a premium on the virtues of discipline, obedience, and order. And they were expressed not just in civic lessons, but in the very organization of the school and the culture which had moved toward a system of rules, bells, punishment, impersonal assembly-like routines. In such places, there was certainly no room for students to express either their intellectual individuality or increasingly their cultural diversity. The progressives began to move beyond the idea of order into the idea of conformity. And that step is a step that was a vital one in, in our history. With immigrations, immigrants pouring into the schools along the eastern seaboard, something called Americanization became the order of the day. As the historian David Tayak remarked, homogenizing American beliefs and values reached a fever pitch. Schools in all the nation's major immigration centers turned their attention to both preparation for industrial economic life and for the requirements of a homogenized American culture that focused on uh, English language, Protestant values, and uh, American uh, cultural attributes. As one reformer put it, they, the immigrants, must realize that in forsaking the land of their birth, they are also forsaking the customs and traditions of that land. Not exactly e pluribus unum anymore. 
schools that had once been controlled locally by hum relatively homogenous ethnic communities. In Milwaukee, bilingual schools uh, run by German immigrants. Uh, in uh, 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 parts of New York, schools that uh, were taught in Italian or Polish um, were pushed away in favor of centrally controlled, bureaucratically determined schools in which this kind of homogenization took place at every level, from the curriculum to the social life. A teacher in one of these schools remarked, uh, her observation was, how students changed their names from year to year. And so in one case, a girl named Esther Osterhein came back to school the next year as Esther O'Brien. <laughs> She sort of forgot the anti-Irish stuff of the 1830s, but that's all right. By, you know, by then it was okay. Uh, Giuseppe Vagnati, Mike Smith. <laughs> for many immigrant families, the sacrifice of home culture for their children was a part of an implicit bargain that exchanged old world traditions for new world opportunities. But for the vast majority of these immigrants, the exchange proved one-sided. As immigrant children, like ex-slaves and blacks throughout much of our history, were tracked into what we would call dead-end jobs. In other words, Cubberly won in a rout. And we are, unfortunately, his direct inheritors. From the beginning, there are these two contending themes in the history of civic education. One is this idea of liberty, the other an idea of order. Beyond both ends, dragons live. And this is what we have to contend with in the modern moment, is how do we, in this era, in this time, create an education system that embraces the liberty of the founders, that characterizes the vitality and commitment and passion that George Washington had for this country, and built into our very fabric. How can we celebrate that while at the same time keeping us from spinning out of control as an entropic set of micro communities that can't talk to each other? So in this, I guess I would say that um, I find uh, the micro communities of social media to be as dangerous to, as, to us as the lack of formal civic education in schools. But that's next year's lecture. <laughs> And where I want to end, I think, is to say um, uh, a couple of things that, that um, uh, David mentioned. David mentioned dreamers. But as we think about this, right, we have another wave of immigrants in this country, some legal, some uh, undocumented. How are we in this generation going to balance liberty and order in a way that celebrates uh, the fundamental values of our society without uh, allowing that entropy uh, to divide us, uh, to divide us in, in dangerous ways. If citizenship is, as Doug suggested, aspirational, um, my aspiration, I think, is expressed, Jack, in the quote that you gave earlier. So I'll end where you started, uh, with, with General Washington. A primary object of, should be the education of our youth in the science of government. It's absolutely true. It was true then, and it's true now. Thanks. Thank you.